Afrika Daniel is a baby among the artists who have collaborated with us to present this series. She's 22 years old and she's pursuing a bachelor's degree in nursing. Speaking of her childhood, Africa said, I grew up with happiness served by my mother every morning in small plates of contentment. Africa attended the Thomas Saunders Secondary School where she met her first literature teacher, Miss Paulette Williams, whom she credits as her first writing guide. At community college, she met another teacher mentor, Mrs. Morgan, whom she credits with scaffolding her writing foundation and confidence. I've paraphrased her statement about Miss Morgan very slightly, but the primary words and their rhythm are entirely Africa's. When I asked Africa to prepare a biography so that I would be able to introduce her to you, she said, I am not a writer or a poet. I don't classify myself to be of that genre or class. Those titles are for persons who make exceptional use of words. Words use me. When she described the writing process, she said, you can kill a word simply by muffling its song or adding a hyphen, and you can bring a word alive simply by calling it into existence. Even if I had not heard her poems, those statements would have been a strong indication to me that she's very probably the real thing. But I have heard her poems, so I can say definitively that she is the real thing. I am a tough critic. I don't make assessments of that kind lightly. Nothing can convince me that the ancestors did not have a very special plan when they sent us Africa. Her parents named her for a free Africa. She's a gift to us as a nation. She is a gift to us as Caribbean people. She's a gift to us as human beings. May we be deserving of her. My name is Africa Daniel. And today I'll be reading a poem entitled Mango Seasons Were Like Black Women with Polish Colds. It was those days of May again, the days May swept together to form one last heap, where the short rain met tenacious heat. Mango trees were promising the valleys that they'll soon be in the height of their prime. Harsey and Paul Over grafted the yard of Julie, a new sealand of Perry Lewis and Graham. But first, five flimsy fluorescents extended from branches, bare and naked butts against the stinging scorch. Then you'll wake up to roosters to see mango tree heads, big, bountiful, and abundant, full of chartreuse green blossoms, like calls sitting on walking melanin. And trunks look like masculine arms gripping, veins popping, holding heavy, and showing rich pride. You'll walk on a premature one, one that had abandoned nurturing arms, far too inquisitive to feel odd, and one too weak against the whispers of the wind. But green sliced ones, unsalted with pepper, edge our teeth, bond our lips, and Ma will say that we'll get high blood pressure. But the mango season without chow chow simply didn't exist. So now the heat had died, and it was April, and it's much expected unexpected showers, and death of blossoms, and the speechlessness of a black woman who had neglected calls, and coils, and roots, and flowers, and the sky will cry, and water will rush down to gutters, and meet thins and cans, voicelessness in it too. And then the mango tree will call you. Yes, over the rain you'll hear bap and splat, and sweetie come brush me, and someone will rush out, a palm-sized green with specks of gold around the stem. If it's fresh, it'll be moist and running liquid. If it was black, it had been there for a long time, and it'll remain there until flies fell friendly for a feast, and I'll ask for half. The thin slice of the teas for my taste buds. I'll have the next call in a while. It never takes long. 
In bread containers will have ugly grey and black stains of rebellion and defeat as they're thrown from canopy, filled to the brim of gold polished and varnished with turpentine we had me reap, and so we did. What we gonna eat? Mawel just biting harder into yellow plump. It was rich and sweet and proud. Then it'll rain harder and blossoms will fall like tiny army men. A sacrifice I resented. It was August now and our kitchen was smelly, a bit sweet, a bit stinky and a bit sticky, all mango charms. And at the bottom of the containers will be fermentation and sour flies. And all around the tree, you'll hear the buzz and demise and mush of mud. And you'll wipe your feet from the dead fungus that was rotting and hiding in some bush. Fine skin and flesh transforming into some unpleasant horror. Gone was all the airy blooms. I always wished the flies were quicker and the worms walked like drunk men bicker. Another dozen we throw away, another dozen we find. Thank Mother Nature for me. But I always look for the ones that were stuck in between half and ripe. Those that didn't leave jewels dripping from your chin, but leave strands between your teeth. Then it was over. Mango season bottled and seasoned with anise seeds and cinnamon, cloves and sugar, in buckets with thyme, stocked and fizzing in dark undershelves like pitchers in a red room, and jean skirts were already washed of dot falls and slips with satisfying intentions and bursts of laughter and mango stains not even mossy gutters will remember. And we won't even recall using and abusing the weaker mangoes like stones to knock down the ambitious smug looking ones on high. But our hands weren't straight all the time, and a collision of mango crushing against humbly bark and we'll dock, and mango blood will get into our eyes, and it will burn for a bit. And the person who passed by the empty tree, being of little vain, to find a mango green in gold glory, the emperor mango will be lucky. But that person is usually the birds anyway, not a robin though, or perhaps it fell and landed in a waste pile of brethren and sistering, hearing the buzz of prayer until it dies. 